So many companies start softball or basketball teams to promote collaboration and boost morale. Some even give free gym memberships to encourage health and good work-life balance. But could exercise also increase actual job performance? Our speaker today, Wendy Suzuki, says it can. She's a neuroscientist who realized this after taking some exercise classes and becoming obsessed. I realized that the grant writing was going well because I was able to focus and maintain my attention for longer than I had before. And my long-term memory, what I was studying in my own lab, seemed to be better in me. And that's when I put it together. Maybe all that exercise was changing my brain. Maybe I did an experiment on myself without even knowing it. This is TED Business. I'm Madhuba Akinola. Our speaker today, Wendy Suzuki, not only studies brain plasticity and memory, but is also an exercise instructor. And at her TED Talk in 2017, she actually made the whole audience stand up and do aerobics. You don't need to do that right now. But I do want you to think about a task on your to-do list that you are dreading. And by the end of the talk, my hope is that you'll have a new strategy which centers around exercise to tackle it. Then after the talk, I'll share a quick tip on how to trick yourself into exercising more. But first, a quick break. What if I told you there was something that you can do right now that would have an immediate positive benefit for your brain, including your mood and your focus. And what if I told you that same thing could actually last a long time and protect your brain from different conditions like depression, Alzheimer's disease or dementia? Would you do it? Yes. I am talking about the powerful effects of physical activity that is simply moving your body has immediate, long-lasting and protective benefits for your brain, and that can last for the rest of your life. So what I want to do today is tell you a story about how I used my deep understanding of neuroscience as a professor of neuroscience to essentially do an experiment on myself in which I discovered the science underlying why exercise is the most transformative thing that you can do for your brain today. Now, as a neuroscientist, I know that our brains, that is, the thing in our head right now, that is the most complex structure known to humankind. But it's one thing to talk about the brain, and it's another to see it. So here is a real preserved human brain. And uh, it's going to illustrate two key areas that we're going to talk about today. The first is the prefrontal cortex right behind your forehead, critical for things like decision-making, focus, attention, and your personality. The second key area is located in the temporal lobe. You have two temporal lobes on your brain, the right and the left, and deep in the temporal lobe is a key structure critical for your ability to form and retain new long-term memories for facts and events. And that structure is called the hippocampus. So I have always been fascinated with the hippocampus. How could it be that an event that lasts just a moment, say, your first kiss, or the moment your first child was born, can form a memory that has changed your brain that lasts an entire lifetime. That's what I want to understand. I wanted to start and record the activity of individual brain cells in the hippocampus as subjects were forming new memories and essentially try and decode how those brief bursts of electrical activity, which is how neurons communicate with each other, how those brief bursts either allowed us to form a new memory or did not. But a few years ago, I did something very unusual in science. As a full professor of neuroscience, I decided to completely switch my research program because I encountered something that was so amazing with the potential to change so many lives that I had to study it. I discovered and I experienced the brain-changing effects of exercise. And I did it in a completely inadvertent way. I was actually at the height of all the memory work that I was doing. Data was pouring in. I was becoming 
known in my field for all of this memory work, and it should have been going great. It was scientifically, but when I stuck my head out of my lab door, I noticed something. I had no social life. I spent too much time listening to those brain cells in a dark room by myself. I um, I didn't move my body at all. I had gained 25 pounds, and actually, it took me many years to realize it was actually miserable, and I shouldn't be miserable. And I went on a river rafting trip by myself because I had no social life. And I came back <laughs> thinking, oh my God, I was the weakest person on that trip. And I came back with a mission. I said, I'm never going to feel like the weakest person on a river rafting trip again. And that's what made me go to the gym. And I focused my Type A personality on going to all the exercise classes at the gym. I tried everything. I went to kickbox, dance, yoga, a step class. And at first, it was really hard. But what I noticed is that after every sweat-inducing workout that I tried, I had this great mood boost and this great energy boost, and that's what kept me going back to the gym. Well, I started feeling stronger. I started feeling better. I even lost that 25 pounds. And now, fast forward a year and a half into this regular exercise program, and I noticed something that really made me sit up and take notice. I was sitting at my desk writing a research grant, and a thought went through my mind that had never gone through my mind before. And that thought was, "Gee, grant writing is going well today." And all the sci- <laughs> yeah, all the scientists always laugh when I say that because grant writing never goes well. It is so hard. You're always pulling your hair out trying to come up with that million-dollar winning idea. But I realized that the grant writing was going well because I was able to. Focus and maintain my attention for longer than I had before, and my long-term memory, what I was studying in my own lab, seemed to be better in me. And that's when I put it together. Maybe all that exercise that、I、had included and added to my life was changing my brain. Maybe I did an experiment on myself without even knowing it. So, as a curious neuroscientist, I went to the literature to see what I could find about what we knew about the effects of exercise on the brain. And what I found was an exciting and a growing literature that was essentially showing everything that I noticed in myself: better mood, better energy, better memory, better attention. And the more I learned, the more I realized how powerful exercise was, which eventually led me to the big decision. To completely shift my research focus, and so now, after several years of really focusing on this question, I've come to the following conclusion: that exercise is the most transformative thing that you can do for your brain today, for the following three reasons. Number one, it has immediate effects on your brain. A single workout that you do will immediately increase levels of neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline. That is going to increase your mood right after that workout. Exactly what I was feeling. My lab showed that a single workout can improve your ability to shift and focus attention, and that focus improvement will last for at least. Two hours, and finally, studies have shown that a single workout will improve your reaction times, which basically means that you are going to be faster at catching that cup of Starbucks that falls off the counter, which is very, very important. But these immediate effects are transient; they, they help you right after. What you have to do is do what I did. That is, change your exercise re- regime, increase your cardiorespiratory function to get the long-lasting effects. And these effects are long-lasting because exercise actually changes the brain's anatomy, physiology, and function. Let's start with my brave, favorite brain area, the hippocampus. The hippocampus, or exercise, actually produces brand new brain cells, new brain cells in the hippocampus that actually increase its volume as well as improve your long-term memory. Okay, and that that in, including in you and me. Number two, the most common finding in、um, neuroscience studies looking at the effects of exercise, long-term exercise, is improved attention function, dependent on your prefrontal cortex. You not only get better focus and attention, but the volume of the hippocampus increases as well. And finally, 
you not only get immediate effects of mood with exercise, but those last for a long time. So you get long-lasting increases in those good mood neurotransmitters. But really, the most transformative thing that exercise will do is its protective effects on your brain. Here you can think about the brain like a muscle. The more you're working out, the bigger and stronger your hippocampus and prefrontal cortex gets. Why is that important? Because the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus are the two areas that are most susceptible to neurodegenerative diseases and normal cognitive decline in aging. So with increased exercise over your lifetime, you're not going to cure dementia or Alzheimer's disease, but what you're going to do is you're going to create the strongest, biggest hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, so it takes longer for these diseases to actually have an effect. You can think of exercise, therefore, as a supercharged 401k for your brain, okay? And it's even better because it's free. So um, this is the point in the talk where everybody says, that sounds so interesting, Wendy, but I really only want to know one thing, and that is, just tell me the minimum amount of exercise <laughs> I need to get all these changes. And so, um, so I'm going to tell you the answer to that question. First, good news, you don't have to become a triathlete to get these effects. The rule of thumb is you want to get three to four times a week exercise minimum 30 minutes an exercise session, and you want to get aerobic exercise in. That is, get your heart rate up. And the good news is you don't have to go to the gym to get a very expensive gym membership. Add an extra walk around the block in your power walk. Uh, you see stairs? Take stairs. Uh, and power vacuuming can be as good as the aerobics class that you were going to take at the gym. So I have gone from memory pioneer to exercise explorer, from going into the innermost workings of the brain um, to trying to understand how exercise can improve our brain function. And my goal in my lab right now is to go beyond that rule of thumb that I just gave you three to four times a week, 30 minutes. I want to understand the optimum exercise prescription for you at your age, at your fitness level, for your genetic background to maximize the effects of exercise today and also to um, improve your brain and protect your brain the best. Bringing exercise in your life will not only give you a happier and more productive life today, but it will protect your brain from incurable diseases. And in this way, it will change the trajectory of your life for the better. Thank you very much. Wendy is pretty convincing, and you might even be inspired right now to go for a run before tackling the next thing on your work to-do list. But the thing is, all those brain-boosting effects come from regular exercise and not just a one-off quick cardio moment before a meeting. And that surge of motivation you're feeling right after hearing Wendy's talk is really hard to sustain. So how do we get ourselves to the gym regularly? Well, my dear friend, collaborator, and grad school buddy, Katie Milkman, came up with a kind of ingenious and super simple way to keep up that momentum. She was having trouble getting to the gym when she was in grad school, so she made a deal with herself. She'd only get to listen to the Harry Potter audiobooks when she was exercising. And it really worked. She started exercising a lot more because, of course, she wanted to find out what happened with Voldemort. Then, when she became a business school professor at Wharton, she wanted to see if this trick would work for other people. So she conducted an experiment. Remember iPods? She recruited two groups of people and gave them iPods. The iPods had really tempting audiobooks on them. High-interest fiction, page-turners, dramas. One group had their iPods with them all the time and could listen to the audiobooks whenever they wanted. The other group only got their iPods at the gym, so listening was restricted to when they were exercising. And there was also a comparison group that got no audiobooks, just certificates at Barnes & Noble. The researchers then measured the gym activity of all three groups. And guess who exercised more? 
the people whose iPods were locked up in the gym and they could only listen to their beloved audiobooks in the gym. Katie calls this strategy temptation bundling. And how do I temptation bundle? I watch bad TV while running on the treadmill. But temptation bundling isn't just for exercise. You can actually pair any guilty pleasure with any task you dislike, like listening to your favorite podcast while doing some mundane data entry like your expenses. So the trick is, if you're in that camp that really does want to exercise more, pair a guilty pleasure with some type of physical activity that makes you sweat to get all those brain-boosting results Wendy mentioned. And soon enough, you'll be both physically stronger and sharper at work. That's it for today. This episode was produced by Maria Luisa Tucker and fact-checked by Eliza Solomon. Our mixer is Sam Baer. And special thanks to Anna Phelan, Michelle Quint, Corey Hajim, and Colin Helms. I'm Madhu Bakanola. Talk to you again next week.